So in today's video, I'm going to talk about the past, the past of YouTube and the original pioneering YouTubers and vloggers who began the whole vlogging scene and, uh, and kind of normalized this whole behavior back uh, in the time of YouTube 2005 to 2007. And the big pioneers at the time were people like uh, Renetto, Paper Lilies, uh, I think it was Bo, 3M3, some of these people I don't know, uh, Kimberley, Filthy Whore, The Hill 88, and Cross Mac, and among others. I used to watch this guy called uh, Tom Gariello. I kind of often wonder what happened to that guy. But uh, back when YouTube was quite small, and it was only starting to become professional, and the corporations were starting to flirt from an adverti advertising point of view, and uh, Paul Robinette, who's Renetto, um, was quite a high-profile guy. You may remember him as the, the guy who did the that prank video was pretty fake, actually, I think, uh, where he swallows the Mentos and then drinks the Coke afterwards. I have a huge amount of respect for him as a businessman and a, as a vlogger, but in this article, he talks about how he was once big and, and then how, obviously how his channel uh, declined in popularity. And in large part, most of the original YouTubers who who suffered from this, uh, this fall from grace, I suppose, um, it was largely due to the fact that they failed or decided not to adapt because they thought that the adaptation um, spoiled the purity of the site in some way and of their work and they just felt uh, unclean by saying things as simple as, hey, please subscribe to my channel if you enjoy what I do. You know, things that we take for granted or, you know, um, you know, you can, well, there was no patron, Patreon at the time, so you couldn't say, hey, support me, you know, throw me a book on Patreon, if you like what I do, or support me on PayPal, or whatever the hell it was. Um, they they were all often had a problem with just simply monetizing their videos because they thought, oh, you're selling out. You used to hear this kind of crap. Now we take it for granted. I mean, people put a lot of effort into their videos, they should be able to monetize them. And so I found this article on wired.co.uk from two, that, two years ago, and it talks about these original um, pioneers, I'll include the link below in the description, and it just comes across a little bit of sour grapes, if I'm perfectly honest. Like, I mean, I know that they had a good run. It wasn't particularly long, it was a couple of years, but, and, and, and some, of, some of the investment that was given to them was built on sand. It could never really be sustainable. It could never really last, uh, because it was all new media coming in to try, and, and uh, companies trying to invest in new media and not really sure where it was going. Um, I'll just read a couple of quotes from it and then I'll kind of delve deeper into my thoughts on it. So Paul Renetto, uh, Google attempted to clean the place up, he says, by introducing its partner program, which allowed channel owners to make money from advertising for the, for the first time. So this was something that Paul occasionally flirted with, but making money from the community seemed to be a troubling notion for him. By the time he became comfortable with the idea, it was almost too late. So he says his contemporaries, who were happy to increase production quality, indulge in aggressive self-promotion and flirt with old media. In other words, companies would come in and, and want to advertise. And in fact, I, I'm not sure who who it was, I think it was Paper Lilies, or one of them, some of these YouTubers I'm not familiar with, but they were paid money from corp from advertisers. Like, you could, they get like $1,000 right there. There you go, promote promote our product. And their channels were, by, by, by today's standards, not very big, but at the time they were huge. And you, you couldn't, there's no universe where you could get that kind of money from sponsoring, from a sponsorship in, in, in a video. You couldn't. It's just, it's not going to happen. On Famebit, you would need to have millions of views per month. And these guys weren't getting those kind of things at the time. It was a completely different market, completely different scale of, of, of the website. But, uh, so the idea that they got this at all, I think that they should, you know, not be uh, looking the gift horse in the mouth, so to speak. They should have been very appreciative of it. I'm sure they were, but... Um, it, it, that was never going to last for very long because as soon as, as soon as more popular YouTubers came along, the whole market would change and uh, where the investment would go. I mean, a lot of these guys were taking a punt on these early YouTubers, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the businesses. They were taking a punt. They were kind of saying, well, we don't really know what the economic value of a view is or a like is or whatever, but we'll give you this money and we'll see how it goes. And now we, we're closer to understanding that. So obviously the money isn't going to be anywhere near like the crazy cash some of, uh, some of these guys were getting in, in third-party uh, sponsorships and donations. So it was, it was a completely different era. He, he says that as soon as he, you know, they're starting to ask for you know, self-promotion, social media, they were starting to increase their production quality as if that's a bad thing. You know, it's very necessary. The videos were in 4.3, they were really poor quality, they were webcams, the audio was terrible. I mean, come on, people wanted better. At some point, they wanted the production standards of television. It's not that they wanted YouTube to become television, it's that they wanted the quality to be there, and the, the download speeds were increasing, the upload speeds were increasing of the web, of broadband, of course, and the internet speeds, and 
uh, the cameras were getting better. Of course, music, invest in a goddamn better camera. You know, that's all we're asking you to do. Better camera, plan your videos a bit more, make them a little bit more stylized maybe. And you know, by all means, you can occasionally ask us to, sus to subscribe and hit that like button. It's not a big problem, is it? But some of these people had a, an issue with that because they got, they kind of had a, the, the, they kind of in institutionalized themselves in a certain sense. Uh, they created their own culture, and in that culture, it um, it was very small, and it was a very small community, and it operated in a certain way. And you were shamed. You were freaking shamed by some people. If you, you know, I remember hearing it at the time. Oh, he's selling out. You see these comments. He's such and such a person. That subscriber is selling out because they've monetized their videos. And I used to feel really bad for them. This is before I was making YouTube videos. And um, and just going, well, he's put in a lot of hard work into it. What's the problem? Um, and again, these guys were these guys were tapped. They were tapped on the shoulder by by Google and YouTube. You know, you guys come on over, monetize your videos before anybody else. And the rest of us were just left on the sidelines. You know, so they had it pretty good, you know? So he says, what happened to me? Why were others successful and not me? Uh, I think I have the answer. I was the YouTube evangelist, and when YouTube didn't need an evangelist any longer, they didn't need me. Meantime, all these other guys were going out there saying subscribe, rate, comment, and they've got theme songs and going full blast. But I couldn't do that. Why not? Why couldn't you? I don't understand. I just couldn't do the transitions and so I became irrelevant. Well, you're not irrelevant, Paul. I mean, you still have 30,000 subscribers. You still have a following. You know, you still have a YouTube channel and people still like and share and comment on your videos and they still enjoy what you do. But you became less relevant by the sounds of things because yourself and your, your contemporaries, the early pioneering YouTubers at the time, decided to not go the extra mile, and, and it's a meritocracy, right, this this place. The best content wins in the end. I'm not saying that necessarily the best content always wins out financially because there's some great content out there that just is hard to monetize or doesn't isn't conducive to sponsorships or you know, there's, big, there's good quality YouTubers who sometimes don't get maybe the money they deserve. That's why we have other things like Patreon and we have other things like that to help people out. But it's tough to see entirely where he's coming from because the rest of us, I mean, I started, I mean, again, these, these guys weren't operating much longer than, than I was. I started in 2007 and started doing uh, tech videos in 2008. I had to learn all of this stuff. We had to learn, whereas these guys, they just kind of were, were figuring it out. And as soon as someone else, the, the rest of the world came in and started going, okay, we see what works and what, what doesn't work. The new people were applying these new techniques and the older people obviously decided not to. And they kind of stuck to their guns. And as a consequence, you know, nobody can be a dinosaur. If we don't adapt to you know, our, your business, I mean, you're going to become less relevant. So that's just gonna happen naturally. They complain about the, the, the video response feature being, being removed. Okay, so the video response feature, and I've said this before, it was unfortunate how Google almost deliberately downgraded its significance, but when you start having people with hundreds of thousands and millions of subscribers, and they put up a video and it gets half a million views in a day, and you, they, they get 100, 200, 300 video responses, and you're, you're you know, navigating through all these video responses, and you know, they're, they're all irrelevant. Nobody's gonna watch all of those. So they had to retire that feature, but video responses still exist. I mean, look at Sargon of Akkad, for example, and other people like him. They do video responses to each other all the time. They don't, there's no video response feature, but you can tag people in videos. You can, you can send the video to them. Yeah, you know, their audience will pick up on it. You know, it's still, it's still there. So it's not a problem, it's just changed. And also they talk about this, oh, that was a golden age for content creators, 2005, 2007, a golden age, a pure golden age. No, it was shit. It was terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, you, you look back with rose-tinted glasses at a lot of things and it's nostalgia talking and it's unrealistic. Maybe certain things were better in the past, but when it comes to YouTube, that is not true. YouTube is way better now than it ever was. All right, YouTube was awful back then. Okay, it was small, it was amateur, the video quality was terrible, you could only make videos about nine, 10 minutes. The communities were really small. Trolls were rife and very powerful back then. So you might get five, six comments on your videos and you get trolls coming in. And it's some nasty comments and they would literally be able to spam the crap out of your videos. There was no moderation, no filter, you had no way of keeping, uh, uh, policing your comments whatsoever. It was terrible. It wasn't a fair and open market whatsoever. Let's look at someone like John Rettinger. Techno Buffalo. He was one of the first people doing tech videos and he exploded. And, and there you go. Because that showed, 
that there was a market, there was an interest in those kinds of videos. And what I don't like about this article is they talk about, hey, the money came in and then everything exploded and professionals came in. Professionals didn't come in. All right, there's no, there was no one getting training on, okay, before you make your first video, you've got to attend a six month course on YouTube video making and then you'll be a professional. Nobody did that. They just started making different types of content. That's all that happened, okay? Before, it was people just sitting around, using webcams, and isn't this amazing? I can upload a video of myself to YouTube. What am I gonna talk about today? I had lunch today, it was great, then I had a walk, and then after that I picked up the kids from school, and then nobody cares. But after a while it was like, well, what else you got, YouTube? And then people came along, like John Rettinger, and like people who were doing makeup tutorial videos, and people doing tuto uh, how-tos for things, and people are doing gaming videos, and people are doing comedies, and different types of things. And they started adding more genres to the categories of YouTube. And as a consequence, they got big because all of a sudden it was like, you ever watch anything on YouTube? Nah, YouTube's a bit shit. No, 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 they've got tech videos now. They've got videos on all sorts of different subjects. Oh, really? I must check that out. And then they discover people. And that's how they get found out. And then you've got these fantastic YouTubers like uh, Marcus Brownlee and like I say, John Rettinger and, 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 and guys like Soldier Knows Best and all these guys and, uh, and they're making these fantastic videos and Linus Tech Tips and Unbox Therapy and all these amazing guys. And there's, it shows there's a market. And these people had, the audiences had nowhere else to go before these, these people came along and started making their tech videos. Nobody understood how YouTube worked at the time, but the market figured itself out and the audiences figured it out. And, uh, you know, that was it. The planning and the production standard and the work that has to go into modern YouTube videos is much higher than it was in the past. Way higher, it's not even, you can't even compare it. So these people who achieve success deserve every ounce of it. It's, it's much tougher on YouTube than it's ever been before and people starting from scratch have it harder than ever. There's a certain inflexibility and kind of arrogance associated with, you know, some of the, the pioneers complaining here. They had it pretty good for a while and they weren't, they had no competition. It's like comparing analog television to digital. I mean, there was like, I remember growing up, we only had six television channels and, and then now we've got hundreds. You know, you, you had nothing else to sit and watch back then, so you, uh, crap television shows had a captive audience. There was very little variety back then, and now there's variety, and that's how, that's how things go. There shouldn't be any special treatment for anybody just because they were there first. It's a meritocracy, and the people who succeed and bring in the most money in any business, they're obviously gonna be the top employees, aren't they, the top earners, and that's how it is on YouTube. And, and then there's the rest of us smaller YouTubers who are just trying to grind along and hopefully grow. Or we have to be open to change, and I've had to change some of my content style, and I remember uh, speaking to a friend before, and I was saying, you know, what else can I do to help grow my channel? And I don't know what, I said, well, what else are you passionate about? And, and then I started doing more uh, videos uh, about, you know, politics and some of them, as you've seen. And so it was just about branching the content out a little bit, and there's nothing wrong with that. There you go, and no disrespect and to, to those early pioneers. It's just um, being stuck in a rigid, inflexible state of mind is, uh, is gonna hurt your YouTube channel. And some people saw it as a business before others. And, and some people were just quicker on the draw, I guess. But that was what I wanted to say about the early days of YouTube. Uh, please tell me uh, your memories of the early days of YouTube and who you were subscribed to and what you used to watch. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.